Well, welcome. Welcome, Peter. Welcome, Kevin, Tamanisha, Paula. It's wonderful to have you here this evening. Welcome to people at home. Um, I can see that folks are still kind of coming into the, the live Zoom room. Just going to take a few moments as people come in and get settled. Um, please do uh, let us know uh, where you're tuning in from. People at home, say hi. We'd love to hear from you. Um, good evening. Good evening. Uh, this is Colonial Canada in the Caribbean. It's a discussion featuring Kevin Edmonds, Peter James Hudson, Paula Hastings, and Tamanisha J. John. And we're going to be taking a critical look at Canada's role in the Caribbean, both past and present. Uh, my name is Bianca Mageni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, which is an organization that uh, challenges unjust foreign policy measures and aims to bridge the gap between the uh, perception and reality of Canada's role in the world. Um, the Institute is based in Montreal or Jojage on the territory of the Ganeangahaga people and the keepers of the Eastern door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Uh, and we also recognize the continued presence of the Métis, uh, Innu and Inuit people on this land. So I just wanna thank you for joining us today. Um, after introductions, our speakers are gonna give their uh, opening remarks. And then we're gonna take about half an hour for questions uh, from the audience following that. So please do put your questions in the Q&A. It's, uh, it's a lot easier for us to find them there. So today, um, as I said, this is Colonial Canada and the Caribbean. Um, it's our Black History Month, and we're taking a critical look uh, at Canada's role in the Caribbean, both past and present. So Canada has been, has long been influential in the, in the Caribbean, particularly in the former British uh, colonies. Um, as an example, for decades, uh, protein-rich refuse cod, for instance, from Newfoundland and Nova Scotia was sold to plantation owners to enable the enslaved to work long hours. And little known is that some of the capital from this was used to set up Scotiabank, uh, the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, CIBC. Um, so it was generated from that trade. And Canadian banks have also long been major players in the region. In the 1970s, the 1980s, uh, the Canadian military undertook preparatory training to potentially invade Jamaica in the event that a socialist government uh, nationalized uh, Alcan's bauxite interests there. Um, present day, uh, just last week, Justin Trudeau attended the CARICOM summit where he pressed Caribbean countries to deploy forces um, to join the US promoted intervention into Haiti. So, you know, these are some of the things that we're gonna be exploring today. Um, like I said, this is, uh, this is part of CFPI's Black History Month programming. And we have some absolutely terrific uh, speakers tonight to explore Canada's history and current relations with the Caribbean. Um, and that, with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Paula Hastings. Paula is the author of Dominion Over Palm and Pine, A History of Canadian Aspirations in the British Caribbean. She's Assistant Professor of History in the Department of Historical and Cultural Studies at UTSC and in the Tri-Campus Graduate Program at the University of Toronto. Her research interests and interests more generally are in Canada's relationship with Britain in the Caribbean since Confederation and in the histories of imperialism, colonialism, race, migration, and nationalism. Welcome, Paula. Uh, thank you so much, um, Bianca, for the invitation um, and um, to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. And I'm very honored to be here with uh, um, uh, Dr. Hudson and Dr. John and um, Dr. Edmonds, um, whose work has been really helpful in uh, thinking through many of the questions that that have animated my own research or over the past couple of years. I want to set per se that the land that I'm speaking to you from today uh, or the land on which the University of Toronto operates here for thousands of years. It's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today it's a meeting place that's still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And I'm very grateful to, to have the opportunity to work on this land. So today, um, just gonna make a note of the time. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit, Bianca had talked a little bit about speaking to the history of the Canada-Caribbean relationship, which of course is a very 
long and complicated and contested relationship. And so what I have to say is going to be uh, necessarily selective. But also, um, I will talk a little bit about the history and then some of the ways in which this history and the ways that it's been written informed my um, my book that Bianca introduced, Dominion Over Palm and, and Pine, and um, try and talk, talk a little bit about some of the, the themes that are emerging from that in relation to the broader history of the Caribbean. So the historical roots of, of Canada's relations with the Caribbean run pretty deep uh, for a long time our understanding of the early history of these relations, you know, dating from the 17th century was confined to trade, you know, statistics about fish and lumber and sugar. Um, because this is how generations of historians of whether it be New France or the Caribbean or the early French and British empires were characterizing the relationship. And of course, this isn't to say that trade was not central, but there was much more to the story. And in large part, due to the important research of scholars like Amani Whitfield and Charmaine Nelson and Afua Cooper, we now have a better sense of how the European colonies in Northern North America in what would become Canada were functioning within the Black Atlantic. And this was something that for a long time generally was ignored by scholars of, of both early Canada uh, as well as the Black Atlantic. And so we know that the French and British colonies in Canada and the Caribbean were connected nodes in the triangular trade, in enslaved Africans, raw materials from the Americas, and European manufacturers. And this went beyond their participation in African chattel slavery for over 200 years. French and British settlers in Northern North America built ships to transport abducted Africans to the Americas. They invested in various Caribbean enterprises that depended on enslaved labor. They supplied low-grade fish to Caribbean planters to feed their captives. They purchased goods like sugar that were produced on slave plantations. So the colonial histories of these two regions were intertwined in such a way that produced enormous economic disparities between them. It was a profound asymmetry that was nourished early on and sustained by European contrived ideas of racial difference and exclusion. So when we try to make sense of the Canada-Caribbean relationships that were perhaps more familiar to many of us today, the Canadian banks, the insurance companies that set up shop in the region in the late, from the late 19th century, Canadian involvement in various extractive industries like petroleum in Trinidad and uh, bauxite in the Jamaican and Guyanese context, or later the tourist industry. It's really crucial that we situate these relationships in the longer history of colonialism, the structures of economic and racial subjugation that have persisted and evolved since slavery. And from at least the 1960s, Caribbean historians and economists have been tracing the challenges that have plagued a lot of the region since emancipation in the 1830s, at least in the British imperial context, uh, and trace them back to the plantation economy. So whether it's a dependency on foreign capital and technology, a structure of production based on foreign rather than domestic consumption, um, or an overwhelming dependence on imports. And they've shown us how, under multinational corporations, the Caribbean has continued to serve the needs of overseas metropolitan economies, primarily as a source of raw materials, uh, more recently as a site of product assembly, and of course, the services industry, and particularly tourism. And there's a number of studies that are coming out that are, are showing us the ways in which, the different ways in which Canada has been involved in this process of, of, of underdevelopment in the region. And then when we look through a different though related lens um, or dimension of the, this relationship, the, the, the history of Caribbean migration to Canada, it's equally important to contextualize this history in the centuries long genealogy of anti-Black racism on the one hand, and then on the long history of Black resistance and activism on the other. Despite considerable racist barriers to this migration, from the late 19th century, many Caribbean people migrated to Canada to work as industrial laborers in urban centers, uh, as porters on the Canadian Pacific Railway, domestic workers in rural, rural and urban homes across the country. Others came north to attend university, to join their families who were already here, to enlist in the Canadian military during the two world wars. And then, of course, there were immigration reforms in 1962 and 1967 and 1976, uh, where in that period, 
of time, British Caribbean immigrants to Canada as a proportion of total Canadian immigration increased fairly dramatically from 0.69% in the 1950s to 11% in the 1970s. But of course, this increase was more the result of Black and allied activisms than Canadian humanitarianism or benevolence. And you only need to look to the history and continuing reality of anti-Black racism in Canada to, to come to this conclusion that the restrictive measures in immigration, they were historically specific, but they were never episodic. They were animated by a deeply rooted commitment to white supremacy and, and Black subjugation that had been nurtured since slavery. So when I set out to explore the history of, of campaigns uh, to expand Canada's borders to the Caribbean, which is the subject of my, my recent book, the broader context of these, these asymmetrical relations were central to understanding how and why these campaigns loomed up again and again on the one hand, and then why they continually failed on the other. So the book stretches from the 1860s to the present. I look at the ebb and the flow of these campaigns in the global context of colonialism and white supremacy, black activism and decolonization. Now, it was a very difficult history to write for a number of reasons, um, because it was not an organized movement that left a neat and tiny archive for me to explore, nor was unionism's apparent allure confined to a particular group, you know, to maritime fishermen or Montreal businessmen or Toronto tourists. People who were enthusiastic about this, they were intellectuals and civil servants and politicians. They were teachers and lawyers and businessmen, writers, bankers, doctors, students, and of course, tourists. Politically, they were conservative and liberal, and from the 1960s, New Democrat. They were mostly English speakers of British descent, although many uh, French-speaking Canadians either promoted union or, or were open to exploring the idea. Most of them understood it as some kind of a sometimes fuzzy political or constitutional association, uh, although the terms of this association changed over time and were much contested. So these unionists that I call, you know, they were a disparate, ever-changing group who took up this idea with varied interests and intensity over time, but they had a lot in common. You know, when they thought about Canada's economic development and sovereignty and purpose in the world, they looked to the Caribbean. They were preoccupied again and again, particularly before 1945, what they saw as Canada's lack of climatic variation. They were convinced that the country's economic independence and continued growth hinged on unrestrained access to tropical regions. And they believe that taking on formal responsibilities, which I put in quotes, in the Caribbean was something that would boost Canada's autonomy and stature in the empire commonwealth, something that would temper American power, something that would enhance Canada's international uh, profile. And so there are a number of things that, that, that I've taken away from this particular um, research that I've done in the book and a number of themes. And so I just want to emphasize a couple of them. Um, and the one is the sort of the relationship to the United States. And when we think about um, the pursuit of Canada, uh, Canadian Caribbean and what this meant, I think it shows us that U.S. power was something that could be in Canada, something that was inspiring as well as you know domineering or suffocating. So these characterizations we often hear about Canada as a nation in America's shadow or as an, an errand boy or semi-colony really obscure the envy and the spirit of rivalry that U.S. imperialism often stimulated in Canada. And I show in different ways how U.S. expansion in the region in the late 19th and through the 20th century was a real impetus for union. But in many ways, it wasn't just a hemispheric story. As I said, it was a global story too. So Canadian designs on the Caribbean they're part of the expansionist fever sweeping the globe in, in the late 19th century. Europe scramble for Africa, Australian designs on the South Pacific, American exploits in you know, the Caribbean and the Pacific really stimulated a preoccupation with the commercial potential of tropical regions and galvanized Canadian interest in the region. Uh, and this continues with um, Union looming up in the midst of really weighty geopolitical developments, like Germany's challenge to British naval and industrial supremacy in the early 20th century, anticipation of the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914, the redistribution of former German colonies during and immediately after the First World War, and of course the shift in global power from Europe to American Soviet Russia after 1945, uh, and and 
uh, concerns about, about communism, global communism. But it also foregrounds, I think, the story in the book, the centrality, as many scholars have done, the centrality of race thinking to Canada's international histories. So unionists' shared vision in the Caribbean derived its meaning from Canada's asymmetrical and deeply racialized relationships within and beyond the country's borders. So unionist designs on the Caribbean were one strategy, really, in a broader repertoire of settler Canadian efforts to secure Canada's privileged position in a capitalist world system that generated and sustained uneven power relations, not just between metropoles and colonies proper, but on the other hand, uh, between colonies on the other. And it was the same sense of entitlement that had been nurtured since slavery that animated their varied impulses to intervene in the Caribbean, to avail themselves of the region's resources, and to dictate the terms on which Caribbean people would inhabit um, the new union. And in the couple of minutes that I have left, what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about sort of the idea, which I do in, in the conclusion to my book, and thinking of through the way, some of the ways in which um, what, what this tells us about, about these, the persistence of these designs over a period of 100 years. Um, some of you may be familiar with the continued interest and rhetoric that comes out uh, about the Turks and Caicos in particular. Uh, and I discussed this, as I said, in my conclusion, but I think that when we see that, that, that the idea popping up year after year, it's really worth thinking about the colonial roots of it, right? So the contemporary iterations that we see are familiar. So the idea of union, like Canada taking on the, you know, take Turks and Caicos, it's, it's, it's regarded as a benevolent Canadian overture, a mutually beneficial scheme that's going to rescue Caribbean peoples from their, their stagnant economies and finally give Canada, you know, a place in the sun. But I, I wonder when I see these articles how these kinds of arguments are escaping critical scrutiny, right? Why is the language of annexing Caribbean islands still used in the 21st century? How is it that articles with headlines like Canada's Caribbean ambition, you know, will we finally get our islands in the sun, are still published by major Canadian news outlets? And I think that the answers lie in the national mythologies that continue to shape our understanding of Canada's history and role uh, in the world. And so these presumptions of Canadian morality and goodness have, as I show in the book, justified unionist designs since the 19th century. But more often, those who hold these kind of idealistic notions of Canada respond to this union idea with sometimes with humor or wonder or, or disbelief. So over the many years that I was preparing this book and, and sharing my research, I frequently encountered confused or surprised expression, sometimes laughter. Like Canadians wanted to annex Jamaica, what, really? Like not Canada. And I think scholars and activists have, you know, for a long time challenged whitewashed images of Canada, the beacon of racial egalitarianism at home and the moral superpower abroad. But the extent to which these critiques have actually resonated in the broader public consciousness is questionable because if they had resonated more broadly, this union idea, and its capacity to amuse would have disappeared a long time ago. And I think that talk of a Canadian Caribbean often elicits laughter because it's seen as something that's antithetical to Canada. But as I try to do, and I'm hopefully done in the book, um, it's shown that unionism wasn't a novelty or an aberration in Canadian history, but it was actually a phenomenon that cohered with the imperial impulses on which Canada was founded, subsequently developed and continues to flourish. I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, that was incredibly informative. What a tremendous overview uh, of Canada's historical role um, in the Caribbean and such a clear, um, there's such a clear uh, presentation of the power relations and, you know, from the ways that Canada has contributed to underdevelopment, to the colonial ideology, to um, the, you know, exposing uh, the, the Canadian mythologies, you know, um, and, and just helping to lift the veil on that. So I put a link to Paula's very important new book uh, in the chat. 
Uh, it's only been, it's basically hot off the presses, it's only been out for a few months, such a necessary contribution. It's called Dominion Over Palm and Pine, A History of Canadian Aspirations in the British Caribbean. Please, please, uh, please do, do get a hold of this book. Uh, a reminder to people to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, Paul, I look very forward to hearing more from you uh, later on in the discussion. Um, so our next speaker uh, of the evening is Peter James Hudson. Uh, Peter is Associate Professor of African American Studies and History at UCLA. His research interests are in history of capitalism, white supremacy, and U.S. imperialism, the intellectual and political economy history of the Caribbean and the Black world, and the history of ra Black radicalism and global anti-imperialism. He's the author of the amazing book, Bankers and Empire, How Wall Street Colonized the Caribbean. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in this afternoon's uh, panel. Uh, good evening or good afternoon to everyone there. I should add one thing to my bio. I'm also a proud member of the Black Alliance for Peace and work very closely with the Haiti Americas team. And I'd also like to give a very special shout out to the great Barbara Bins uh, in Vancouver. Uh, who I've seen in the chat. It's Black History Month, and I've been asked to talk about the history of Canada's banking and financial institutions in the Caribbean. I'd like to approach that history in a slightly roundabout and counterintuitive fashion by beginning with the novelist, uh, with the late Bayesian novelist, George Lamming. Now, in November 1961, George Lamming published an essay in the Canadian magazine Maclean's, the magazine that I'm sure most of you, at least most of you north of the border, are familiar with. The article was titled, The West Indians, Our Loneliest Immigrants. It recounts Lamming's visit to Canada to not only document the lives of West Indian immigrants, but to simply find West Indian immigrants. And in 1961, Lamming did not find that many. Lamming described Toronto as utterly white, and he'd had to travel to Forest Hills kitchens and church basements in Montreal to find West Indian people. Citing literature from the Canadian Department of Immigration, Lamming discovered that in 1959, precisely 280 West Indians had immigrated to Canada, the majority to Toronto, with a handful to Vancouver, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec, and Winnipeg. All of them were women employed as domestic labor, and they were largely separated from each other, dispersed across the 4,000 mile wide geography of the Dominion. Lamming found a small fragmented dispersed population confronted by racism, but also engulfed with loneliness. That loneliness for Lamming was not merely personal, but structural. Looking at the numbers and looking at the dispersal of Caribbean people across the country, uh, with no one place developing a critical mass, Lamming wondered if Canadian immigration policy towards Black people was dis determined in part by what he described as a technique of separation. This technique of separation, Lamming suspected, was a deliberate attempt by the Canadian government to, pre to prevent Black people from congregating en masse and organizing en masse. Of course, since the time of Lamming's visit to Canada, the numbers of Black people has increased dramatically. But I want to argue that that technique of separation remains for understanding Canada's internal racial dynamics, but also the racial dynamics of its foreign policy in the Caribbean. Which leads me to the question of the history of Canadian banking in the Caribbean. But what you may be wondering, does George Lamming's McLean essay have to do with this history? First, I'd like to suggest that Lamming reminds us that any history of banking in the Caribbean is not mer merely a history of the abstractions of finance, but it is always a history of labor, a history of people. We cannot begin to talk about the history of Canadian banking in the Caribbean without asking how it has affected the life and labor in the region, extended and perpetuated forms of racism and Black dispossession of Black underdevelopment and exploitation, and contributed to the ongoing issue of Black migration to Canada and elsewhere that has been a hallmark of Caribbean history. Second, Lamming reminds us that we cannot examine that history without turning to those writers, those Caribbean writers, who have gone beyond an analysis that moves beyond questions of class, but beyond critiques of political economy, and beyond histories of a race-free imperialism to understand class 
political economy, and imperialism as being bound up with race, racism, and specifically a white supremacy whose effects on Black people have been savage and unrelenting. Thus, before one turns to the banks for a history of Canadian banking in the Caribbean, I ask you to turn to the novelists, the poets, and the writers, to George Lamming, but also to Lillian Allen and Marlene Norbessie Phillips, to Norman Gervan and Erna Broadbur, to C.L.R. James and Walter Rodney, to Louise Bennett and Odimumba Kwamdele, and to many, many others. These writers do not always necessarily offer a history of banking per se, but they provide us with the vocabularies, grammars, and narratives to begin to understand how to understand what the history of banking means for Black people in terms of class and race, but also in terms of gender and sexuality. Now, if you want a straightforward history of Canadian banking in the Caribbean, you can go to the RBC website or the Scotiabank website or the website of the Bank of Montreal, and they will give you a neat timeline of their endeavors, of their successes, and of their failures. Or you can go to your local library and get their big in-house corporate biographies, books that are full of details of names and places and dates. They are full of useful information, but ultimately unsatisfactory information. The corporate histories will tell you things that we already know, that in part, the origins of institutions like the Bank of Nova Scotia and the Royal Bank of Canada are in the Canadian Maritimes, and they were tied to the trade of salt, cod, sugar, rum, and lum lumber with the British West Indies. But they won't mention that those commodities were critical in building up an economy of capitalism built on the labor of enslaved Africans in the Caribbean. They will tell you that by the early 20th century, the banks were involved in financing railroads and sugar plantations in Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, and Trinidad, but they won't tell you that exploited free black labor was a necessary basis for their profits. They will tell you that they were present during the long process of Caribbean decolonization and the movement towards Caribbean independence, but they won't tell you that they refused to employ black tellers and black clerks, only porters and servants, and that their directors remained white. And they won't tell you that when black power tried to change the racial order of banking in the Caribbean, that was the moment they washed their hands, hands of the Caribbean, deeming the region too much of a risk for their profits. Nor will they tell you the history of Caribbean resistance to Canadian banking through the indigenization and localization of Canadian banks, through strength strikes and bank runs, through street protests and militants attacks, and through the attempt to organize other types of credit and banking institutions based as Carolyn Shanaz Hossein up at York has documented on African and Indian economic tradition and practice. They also won't tell you that George Lamming's technique of separation, that is of divide and rule, was critical to their history in the Caribbean. It is better for Canadian bankers and indeed Canadian diplomats for the Caribbean to remain a fragmented archipelago divided by colonial languages and small island nationalism than to have the region sharing an economy a currency, a banking system. Better Cuba is isolated from Jamaica and Hades, Haiti, and Barbados from Martinique and Guadeloupe, then the political and economic borders between them dissolved. It is better to have the Royal Bank of Canada or the Bank of Nova Scotia or Santander or BNP reap their spoils from the Caribbean than the Caribbean share its own wealth. The technique of separation remains, and so too does Lamming's loneliness. Those today, it is not the lonely, loneliness of the West Indian migrant in Canada, but it is the loneliness of Haiti within Canada's foreign policy. As the government of Black-faced unfortunate son Justin Trudeau seeks to use CARICOM to separate Haiti from the Caribbean with the aim of extending Canada's corporate and financial reach into the West Indies. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise, but that corporate and financial reach is also the reach of white supremacy. It should be the task of all good Canadians to use the archive of Caribbean writing to understand and the history of Canadian banking in the Caribbean, and to realize that the history of Caribbean labor and resources has been crucial to Canada's history. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that rousing presentation, for all of that knowledge, for helping our listeners to really understand um, the history of Canadian banking and its impact uh, on countries in the Caribbean. Uh, please do check out, I put it in the chat, the link. Uh, please do check out uh, Peter's uh, incredible book, Bankers and Empire, How Wall Street Colonized the Caribbean. Um, and Peter, I look so, so forward to hearing more from you 
uh, during the Q&A. And for those of you who have been asking, yes, we will be rebroadcasting uh, this discussion to both uh, uh, Zoom, sorry, to both our YouTube channel and uh, to Facebook. I put the link to Facebook there. Please do consider sharing this with your colleagues and communities. It's important that we share this information with as many people as possible. That's a huge part of this work is, uh, is the education. Um, so next up, uh, we have Kevin Edmonds. Uh, Kevin is a professor of Caribbean studies at the University of Toronto, specializing in Caribbean political economy, histories of alternative illicit development, foreign intervention, and the region's radical political tradition. His publications include Ga Guns, Gangs, and Garrison Communities in the Politics of Jamaica at the Turn of the Century, and An Elusive Independence, Neocolonial Intervention in the Caribbean. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much, uh, Bianca, for having me. And I just want to warn everyone tonight that uh, this is going to be the low light of the, the evening because it's going to be really hard to follow who my two comrades that just spoke, uh, Dr. Hudson and Dr. Hasten, I'm sure, uh, as well with Dr. John. Um, so I just wanted to uh, give a big thank you to in for including me uh, this evening. I had some notes prepared. My son spilled his grape juice on it um, a bit earlier, so I've salvaged what I can. Um, but I really wanted to thank um, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute for just giving us the chance to speak to this. Because I think a lot of times Canada can actually fly under the radar, as uh, folks have mentioned. Um, there's always something that pops into my head when we talk about US imperialism, British, French, imperialism and that is we don't ask any questions about Canada and what they do or what Canada does um, because we tend to be looking um, to the neighbors below or across the Atlantic and say we're not the same as them that's really ingrained in Canadian culture and I know that's one of the motivations as to why we're talking about this evening that we had a prime minister uh, Stephen Harper who talked about this is one of the reasons why Canada needs to get more involved, uh, whether that's in NATO or through the Organization of American States, is because Canada is different. We don't have this history of colonialism like other great powers have, which if you ask Indigenous people in Canada right now, you know, they would be throwing things at you because that's simply not true. But Canada is somehow able to walk this line, and we're seeing it happen right now. Um, when it comes to, to Haiti, which I'm going to speak to in a bit more detail, but I also wanted to give a shout out to a comrade who's on the, the list. I saw uh, Chris Ramsrup, who does a lot of really important work with Justicia for Migrant Workers. And how Canada continues this history of extractive um, industries, not just in terms of ripping stuff out of the ground, which you would associate with you know, earlier forms of colonialism and, and sending it back. Um, but also when it comes to labor, we're, we're actively moving people from the Caribbean and from Latin America to come and work on our farm because we don't want to um, you know, put decent conditions in place. We want to extract labor from these people. So, so Canada is really not any different. Um, but I think the fact is that we don't shine the light on it in that sense, that we'll look at, you know, maybe the bigger, you know, I know Canada is involved in Ukraine, um, but, a lot, but a lot of these things that happen in Canada can slide through. So we occupy this kind of quasi imperialist space where I think those of us that are here um, and I know we all have roots uh, some way or one another uh, to, to Canada or that we want to try and understand how Canada plays this role. Um, yeah, exactly. To, to uh, Tiki's point right there, that we try to say we're not as bad as the others, right? So that allows us to do what's happening right now is that um, I'm going to jump a bit forward, but I do have those remarks still there with the grape juice. Um, which actually speaks to several important things where, you know, I know that Haiti is probably the most pressing and I'll transition to it. Um, but talking about the Caribbean, and I'm glad that we're not just focusing on one specific, um, you know, country or, or, or territory, but looking at how we have a wide ranging presence of extractive, extractive industries from the Dominican Republic to Guyana. Um, we don't tend to think about Honduras or Colombia as being part of the Caribbean, but if we look at the demographics and the history of the plantations there, um, definitely it fits in. Um, so we have uh, Canadian tourism companies taking out um, indigenous or Garifuna land defenders in Honduras. We have them taking out Afro-Colombian 
uh, labor leaders that have been fighting against the mining companies. Um, and it has been mentioned that, you know, Canada has this kind of uh, really antagonistic relationship with Jamaica, where we threatened to basically drop an atomic bomb on their economy if they tried to move forward through within a bauxite levy, which really was, I don't know how you could frame it, like um, a win-win deal. The colonial governments and the colonial territory basically giving Jamaica's bauxite away for free. And Jamaica wanted to renegotiate that. And Canada stepped in and said, you know, we will, we will basically um, not place sanctions, but we'll withdraw our, our economic investment, foreign investment, to really make you um, realize how important we are and to punish you for thinking differently or trying to actually have control over your own self-determination and building up your own industries. So you can fast forward to today. Um, Canada's kind of slowed down when it came to its cannabis industries, but in Jamaica, we were the largest uh, foreign investor in there. It has to do with our laws because federally it was legalized compared to the United States where that's done on a state by state basis. Um, but even when it comes to our increasingly problematic policies under the Safe Third Country Act, um, which Canada is trying to now renegotiate due to um, these problematic political pictures about Justin Trudeau being soft on uh, what they call illegal migration, um, particularly from places in West Africa, Central America, and Haiti, where we're all active, um, you know, as, as the Canadian military or through peacekeeping. Um, I'll throw those up because I don't believe that's true. Um, we're creating the people that have to leave their homes, right? So um, that we're undermining the ability of people to be able to claim asylum. And Canada's trying to close those loopholes, and we're seeing that they're actually trying to bring in Mexico as a, another third country in here so that we don't have to deal with um, people crossing the border, that we could use Mexico or the United States as a way to kind of insulate ourselves from the problems that we're creating um, around the region um, and also around the world. But so, something, um, and, and please let me know when the time um, hits, is that I was trying to look back um, not through the archives, I'm not a historian, but trying to find an articulated policy about how Canada tries to fly under the radar. And something that came up, there was repeated conversations during uh, the early 1960s when the Cuban revolution happened, but there was also the dictatorship that emerged in Haiti. And there was also the repression of the um, uh, purported revolution or rebellion in the Dominican Republic. And the United States um, at the time actually signed on and said that they wanted to be clear that they wanted to remove themselves from any action and charges of intervention and to claim that all of these um, repressive movements, so the Bay of Pigs would be there, were indigenous, to, to remove uh, themselves from being um, looked at as imperialists, that it's somehow, you know, people. Uh, on the ground or somehow carrying out Canadian or American foreign policy, right? And, and Canada really snatched up on this because looking through the correspondence through, uh, it was the American ambassador to Haiti, Raymond Thurston, uh, speaking with his Canadian counterpart. And it reminded me, um, and, and you can Google this um, when it comes up. I know that's not the biggest academic thing that you can say, um, but it really shows you how they were talking in the 1960s, and, and, and I'm sure my, my friends on um, the call can actually tell me it was much sooner, and it's something that you know has a, a longer precedent. But this is what Canada has really taken and run with, and, and it reminds me of something that Edward Said said, which is that every empire tells itself um, in the world that it's unlike all other empires, right? Its mission is not to plunder, but to uh, and plunder and control, but to educate and liberate. And this is what Canada is trying to do right now, that I think when a lot of us look at the situation in Haiti, no one is going to stand up and say that we, we don't think that everything is moving in the right direction. We realize that there's multiple crises that are happening on the ground right now. But I think what a lot of us would want to do is actually to say we need to rewind to understand what's happening, that Canada is trying to do these really soft, um, and, and, and I'll put that again into quotations, um, really test the ground to see how far it can get away with, what the reaction will be internationally about this intervention, but also what the reaction will be domestically. And they're floating a lot of things talking about there's gonna be this kind of, um, 
I, I read this, it was about, I think it was a couple of weeks ago where they were talking about uh, making connections to Somalia when Clinton went in, right? That because the, the, the gangs are so heavily armed that we don't want to send Canadian troops over there to actually get killed for a meaningless intervention, right? And that's what most of our media coverage in Canada speaks about is that we're coming in with this benevolent um, kind of reasoning and that we don't have this longer history of intervention. So I'm really glad that, that both of the um, speakers before me were able to highlight that, that this is something that has been longstanding and that Canada has a much more nefarious role when it comes to the Caribbean, particularly in, in Haiti. I know that 2004 was a, was a really large flashpoint where um, we, in some ways, what I'm worried about is that what we're seeing is that we're re, we're trying to have an unelected uh, leader call in for foreign intervention. That's what happened in 2004, right? When Jean Bertrand was illegally overthrown by our government in Canada, um, and he was exiled uh, to the Central Central African Republic, and that uh, we're seeing right now with um, Ariel Henry where he's been able to set up this commission where they're not only just setting up um, a group to call for elections, but also if you look at it to rewrite the constitution, right? So there's a lot of sketchy, sketchy things that are happening. And we see more conservative governments in the region uh, from the Bahamas to Jamaica saying they're all on board and we're not getting any historical context or even like actual context from the modern um, era right now as to why they would be on board with seeing Haiti kind of um, cut down once again. That the Bahamas um, has been really, really terrible when it comes to Haitian uh, refugees on its own territory in 2019 after Hurricane Dorian. I think they bulldozed a lot of communities that Haitians lived in. Uh, so they see Haitians as a problem to be controlled and that Canada has actually found a very willing partner in the Bahamian government, which is also has been reluctant to work with CARICOM um, throughout its history. So they see themselves as this kind of intermediary. So there's a lot of things that I think we still need to unpack, but, but by looking at the history of Canada, I think we all have good reasons to be skeptical as to why that is. I think I have three minutes, but I'll save that for the Q and A. Um, I warned everyone it would be terrible. Thank you. On the contrary, thank you, Kevin, for that brilliant, brilliant presentation um, for just such a clear and broad overview of, of current day Canadian involvement and interventions in the Caribbean, um, from Haiti to mining to tourism to just the, the critical importance of not letting Canada's role slide under the radar. Um, and the links that we need to be making to Canada's colonial legacy here on Turtle Island and more. So please do check out, uh, Kevin has, a num has written a number of important books, including an elusive independence, neocolonial intervention in the Caribbean. Um, Kevin did talk about Haiti, there is an action that you can take on our site, uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, no to Canadian military intervention in, in Haiti. And I, I put that in the chat. So please do take that action and uh, and share that as well, uh, right to, to, to Trudeau and just, just say no. Um, our next speaker of the uh, evening slash afternoon, depending on where you are, is Tamanisha J. John. Um, she is an assistant professor of international political economy at Clark Atlanta University, where she teaches courses on international political economy, politics, and global issues. She holds a PhD in international relations from Florida International University, holds an MA in Latin American and Caribbean studies from Florida International University as well. And her research interests include Caribbean development, economic imperialism, financial exclusion, and Canadian overseas banking. Welcome, Tamanisha. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute for having me as well. Um, as people are talking, I always try to erase what they say from any of my notes or talking points uh, just so that it won't be as repetitive. And I guess uh, tonight I will be talking about uh, the recent meeting that just happened in Haiti, but also structural adjustment and just Canada's role in the Caribbean more generally as everyone else has. And so for people who may not know, last week from February 15th to 17th, there was the 44th Heads of Government CARICOM meeting in the Bahamas to talk about CARICOM's 
single market economy, food security, and climate change with the goals of coming up with collaborative regional solutions to address all of these issues. However, given that the special invited guest was Justin Trudeau, the uh, Prime Minister of Canada, the issue of military intervention in Haiti was also on the agenda. Um, this trend towards intervention as proposed by Canada received support from governments like Jamaica's Andrew Holness and Haiti's incumbent and illegitimate President Ariel Henry, uh, both prior to the CARICOM meeting and during it. But this stance of intervention in Haiti and the Caribbean is not without opposition. We do have uh, people like Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who's made it clear that he would not be supporting any military intervention into Haiti because Haitians would rightly view that intervention by external states and actors propping up this illegitimate president um, as an affront to their political, social, economic, and uh, you know, ecological self-determinations there. Um, nonetheless, you know, even though there was uh, some opposition, Prime Minister Trudeau still announced at this meeting that Canada would be sending two warships to Haiti to quote unquote, fight urban gangs and gather intelligence. But of course, Canada's surveillance of Haiti was already an issue prior to this meeting last week because Canada has had military grade jets flying over the island constantly to engage in surveillance gathering. The addition of Canadian warships are to monitor Haiti's coastal waters, but more importantly, to potentially see which kinds of materials are coming in and out of the Haiti and also to prevent uh, Haitians from trying to leave the island. And so it's also serving as an extra added restrictive immigration measure. Now, of course, Trudeau shrouded Canada's militarism and intervention in this language of quote unquote, helping the Haitian people, which is not unusual for Canadian politicians to do. From the 1960s to the 1980s, anti-communism along with surveillance and intervention that comes along with this ideology and political strategy made Canada one of the biggest givers of foreign aid to the Caribbean region. And although this aid tremendously helped Canadian businesses in the region and increased Canada's uh, own political and military sway there, many people still believe that this aid was to simply help Caribbean development. Canadian aid disbursement often requires the further liberalization of local markets in the Caribbean in a way that favors and strengthens foreign corporations and foreign ownership of capital. And Canadian aid itself is one of the ways that Canada integrates Caribbean states into the liberal capitalist economic order to facilitate the various kinds of economic imperialisms and exploitation that it is engaged in in the region. The interpretation of Canada as a friendly giver of aid and debt to the region since the 1960s has allowed Canada and Canadian financiers to lead IMF and World Bank groups, uh, which ensure that states in the region are adhering to strict debt clearing measures and other structural adjustment uh, measures and conditionalities. Um, and also Canadian aid and it's seen as a leader in these types of international organizations and international financial organizations has also allowed it to justify its own militarism in the Caribbean cloaked in, again, this language of humanitarianism, even though they are uh, simply protecting Canadian investments in the region. In the 1970s, Canada spied on Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Grenada using Jamaica to test its deployment capabilities and its military technologies in the region. And so Canada's history of anti-communism aid in the Caribbean also informs and cements its early collaboration, early security collaboration with states like Jamaica, um, who today hosts Canada's operation support hub that they proclaim to not be a military base, even though by all standards, it's just housing military equipment and has the ability to house a lot of Canadian soldiers there. Um, the Canadian International Development Agency in 1982 singled out Cuban revolutionary activity as the main threat to political and economic stability in the Caribbean region and implied that development aid from Canada would stave off Cuban interference in states. Um, even though they were outwardly cordial with governments like Grenada, they did view that country with suspicion because of what it feared would be Cuban internationalism. And so when the PRG project uh, was decimated in 1983, Canada's commitment to aid and intervention in the Caribbean region also increased. Um, and of course, Canada does sustain interest in mining, banking, insurance, and other kinds of resource extraction in the Caribbean. And that also helps to betray its uh, you know, militarism and intervention in a lot of these uh, states that we're talking about. 
Um, Dr. Edmonds mentioned before me that Canada helped to plan and facilitate the coup in 2004. And one of the reasons why Canada was there even prior to the United States is because today Canada is one of the biggest uh, key donors to the security sector in Haiti, uh, contributing not just to policing, but also prisons and like, you know, guarding the border or guarding immigration uh, to some respect. And when we look at the Caribbean region as a whole, uh, there was a lot of focus tonight on the British speaking Caribbean, but Haiti is the state most subjected to interventions by Canada's military and policing forces, wherein since 1951, 55% of all Canadian military operations in the Caribbean have occurred in Haiti. And so it is not surprising that it was, you know, Canada who first in October 2022 made the call for military intervention in Haiti. Um, and I will say that you have this, again, this humanitarian narrative that Canada is contributing to worldwide peace, not just in the Caribbean, but throughout the world. Um, however, that is also false. Um, Canada spends uh, the majority of its funds when it's talking about humanitarianism or peacekeeping abroad in investing in military planes, ships, and equipment. Um, and so it is not going around helping states in crisis. A lot of Canada or a lot of Canada's peacekeeping uh, contributions have actually decreased since the 1990s, and Canada has had an almost exclusive focus on U.S.-led or NATO-led interventions and invasions um, in other countries for over the past two, almost three decades. One thing that I do think that we should talk about more is how international organizations like the UN, as well as international financial organizations like the IMF and World Bank legitimize Canadian exploitation and militarism in the Caribbean. And I will just end here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Tamanisha. Brilliant, brilliant presentation. It was really important for us to get that critical perspective, a clear overview of the ways that Canadian banks have promoted, benefited from structural adjustment, um, the current Canadian militarism in general, um, but also specifically the, the buildup um, among other elements of you know, in the Caribbean itself, um, and so much more. We're so we're so lucky uh, to have to have you um, doing this important and, and critical research. Um, we're now at the end of our presentations. Um, that was incredible. I know that I personally learned a lot. Um, I do want to remind people to put your questions in the Q and A if you have them. We have a few in there. We also re received some in advance. And I'm going to try and get to as many uh, of them as we can, time permitting. Um, I also want to remind viewers that uh, if you do like presentations like this, please do support our work at foreignpolicy.ca slash, uh, slash donation. All right. So um, the first question that we have is from John. Um, John wants to know whether our panelists can frame uh, this, I think this being the discussion more generally. Um, and the unionist view from Canada to the Caribbean in the context of U.S. imperialism and the Monroe doc Doctrine. Um, and John wants to know how, how does all this fit in with Canada as a junior partner to the U.S.? So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put this first to one of, uh, one of our speakers from the U.S. Um, Peter, do you have any thoughts on that, Canada as a junior partner? <clears throat> I say two things. First of all, I think um, Canada as a nation has to do uh, really come to grips with, uh, I think, two psychic moments that have uh, kind of created uh, an ideology of white supremacy that links it with the United States and, and finds a kind of convergence through uh, uh, expansion. And, and those two psychic moments are, first of all, the history of Western European immigration to Canada and, and the decimation of indigenous peoples, um, and which we're still now finding the bodies uh, as, as a result of that, as, as we all know. Um, and then the second one is the history of Eastern European immigration after World War II. And, and we're seeing this through people like Christia Friedland and, and this Bandera cat, where we have to really come to grips with the fact that the people who came from Eastern Europe after World War I were after World War II, excuse me, were um, anti-communists, in some cases Nazis, often fascists. What does that mean now for Canadian foreign policy when those two long histories of three or four or 500 years of, of white supremacist immigration practice is now determining Canadian foreign policy? So that's the first thing. The second thing we have to understand when we're talking about Canadian finance 
in, in the Caribbean in relationship to uh, US foreign policy in, in the Caribbean. Canadian bankers were slick. The Royal Bank of Canada um, was in many cases a, a larger presence in places like Haiti um, and, and definitely Cuba uh, than, than Wall Street institutions. Um, and so the, the, that while Canada wasn't um, actively involved uh, through sending troops during the era of dollar diplomacy in the 1910s and 1920s, Canadian bankers actively benefited from the presence of US military in the region. And so Canadian bankers, as the official historian of the Royal Bank of, of Canada will tell you, acted as surrogate US bankers in the Caribbean. They were the ones who were uh, establishing branches in, the, in the, the Caribbean before US bankers were permitted by the uh, establishment of the Federal Reserve System in, in 1914, they were involved in financing U.S. trade, and in some cases, again, with the Royal Bank of Canada, um, uh, Chicago investors owned a huge stock of, 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 of the bank from, uh, I think, about 1902. So that we have to understand racially and financially, there's a convergence of interest that is supported by U.S. military presence. Thank you, Peter. Tamanisha. Yes, I also want to add that I think that using convergence is a lot better than saying junior partner or U.S. lackey or U.S. lag dog, because oftentimes I find that when people talk about Canada as being sort of, you know, a U.S. lap dog or just following U.S. interests, they ignore things like the fact that Canada didn't join the OAS early on because it didn't want to be perceived as a U.S. lap dog so that it could easily exploit countries who didn't associate it with the U.S., it also is the reason why the Canadian left, uh, you know, historically and to some extent presently have been unable to address why Canada acts the way that it does in the Caribbean region. And I think that when you say Canada is simply a junior partner, you're by default making Canada, again, seem a lot friendlier than the U.S., even though exploitation is exploitation, right? And so there are many instances where Canadian policies uh, disregarded the U.S. or didn't align with the U.S. precisely so that they could reach their own uh, exploitative aims in the Caribbean and just also in other states and countries. So I think it's important to uh, get away from this narrative of junior partner that doesn't allow for a critical analysis of Canada. Thank you, Tamanisha. Does anyone else want to chime in on this notion of Canada as junior partner? Kevin? Yeah, it's something that always comes up when uh, so I teach in Caribbean studies and an issue that students raise the first few weeks and I have to put it very plainly to them about Canada's perceived like morality. Um, you know how the states have this nasty history of slavery, right? Or ignore Eastern Canada, right? Like forget about that. Um, but then talk about we're the country that had the Underground Railroad, right? This is what Canada promotes itself as. And I say, come on, look at climate, geography. The same people settled the same place. It's not like they sent the nice people up to the north and the bastards down to the south and that we ended up in something better, right? Comes down to what the cash crops were and what was being grown. And that, and I mean, there can be a maybe a bit more nuance to it, but I think that's a huge part of it is that we, we've kind of strategically divorced ourselves from like global political economy. I know that's not what, you know, but, but to say that we're not interested, we're about westward expansion and how learn, learning things about like how connected we actually are to the Caribbean, that there was an article by Deborah Cohen that talked about how uh, Barings Bank, which was the bank that paid out the reparations to the British slave owners when emancipation happened. All of the interests that accrued on that initial loan that the, the British government was making, that's where John A. McDonald went and got the money to build the, the railroad. You know, so there's so much here that we're still just digging into that I think like Canadians have no idea what's, what's really coming and just how invested we actually are literally uh, in terms of the banks and infrastructure, the labor programs that are bringing people over with empire. Right, it's just that as I see in the comments and other people have said as well that we're just we're just slick with it because the states might be a bit more brash with it, um, but we're doing as much 
if not sometimes more, given we're 10 times smaller, right? That we can get away with a lot more that the states, they have the spotlight on them. So Canada will come will come in. So so definitely, I think that that's, that's an important point um, when it comes to, to mining, but also finessing through a lot of these deals that um, whether it's through the OAS, through the core group, that if the states was involved in, you know, carrying the, the big stick and hitting people over the head, Canada kind of does that, right? And I think Tammy, you should point about, we strategically did not get involved in these organizations so that we could like back channel is really important because Canada, Canada maintains this um, as the way that we do politics, right? So that we can always, you know, keep up the facade that we're somehow different or better. Or we have this, the history without, colonialism as Stephen Harper would say. But but yeah, I'll stop there. Oh, I think you're muted, Bianca. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Paula, <laughs> do you have thoughts on the uh, the question of Canada as junior partner? Uh, yeah, just uh, I think that these kind of characterizations that we hear again and again, um, as you know, whether it's the junior partner or the the errand, the errand boy, you sometimes hear as well, the errand boy of the U.S. are really kind of shelter Canada from the critical scrutiny that that it should be under. You know, to efforts to kind of position Canada in in contrast to the U.S. have generated other many per pernicious narratives over time that really continue to obscure what you know contemporary inequalities within Canada and struggles for racial justice like. Historically, English speaking Canadians have defined themselves in opposition to the United States since at least the American Revolution, right? And then various nationalist narratives arose from this non American and often anti American posturing, including the negation of racism and of colonialism and imperialism and violence and capitalist greed, right? Um, like settler colonial relationships with indigenous peoples were founded, this idea that they were founded on friendly and peaceful partnerships, right? Not the violence and exploitation that characterize relations between US settlers and Native Americans. Black Canadian history was marked by freedom and justice and racial egalitarianism, not slavery and segregation and racial violence and disenfranchisement. You know, Canada is a cultural mosaic, a land of multiculturalism and equal opportunity, not an intolerant and aggressively assimilationist melting pot, right? But minimizing Canadian racism and imperialism by way of U.S. comparisons, uh, you know, fewer peoples enslaved, less racialized violence in Canada is really a specious line of argumentation that we've really got to get beyond. But it just it seems we seem to be so often locked in this kind of need to minimize what was going on in Canada in relation to to what the United States was doing. Um, and it's completely unproductive. Thank you, Paula. We have a question from Amina who wants to know whether this uh, will be on YouTube or online to watch again. Yes, Amina, we will be posting this to our YouTube channel. You can find it there. Please do share it. It's also going to be uh, on Facebook where we are um, Facebook living right now. In fact, I'd encourage people to share this with as many people as possible. It's really important uh, that as many people as possible do uh, do hear from, from our incredible speakers. This is a very important topic. Um, we have a question from Jibo who wants to know, does Canada participate uh, in Southcom? And we also had a question submitted earlier, which maybe I'll put together with this, um, which is why does Canada seem to have so much power uh, with, within CARICOM? So uh, those two questions, is Canada, does Canada participate with Southcom? And then uh, what's all this power? that uh, Canada seems to have with CARICOM. Um, do any of our speakers have any thoughts on either of those questions? I don't know the full extent, but I know the Canadian military is involved in Southcom. Um, in terms of specific incidents and like a longer, I, I, I wouldn't be, uh, I'd be like most professors to say that I know, I do not know. Um, but we we are involved just at a at a surface, and I think what we're seeing happening right now in terms of of Haiti, um, but also patrols that have happened, um, ship rider agreements that were signed, um, drug trafficking initiatives that that Canada does get involved, not to the same degree, but but we do want to test the waters to see how far we can go, maybe um, to see what the states can do. 
but also we really like to push um, governments within CARICOM to be the ones to take the hits because in case something goes wrong, we'll say, well, that's the regional partners that did something wrong, right? And I think that that's a really big, big part of what um, we're, we're doing right now. And we don't have as large a military when it comes to the Navy, but I think more it's how, how we use policy to pressure other um, governments, coast guards, right, in the case of the Caribbean, to, to be able to intercept and do the work that we want them to do. Because I'm in St. Lucia right now, and I was just talking with a friend who works at, at the, the National Guard. Um, he's in charge, and I won't out him, but he's in charge of fixing the radar. And he said, we don't fix it at all because we're just totally dependent on the parts being sent from Canada so that we can intercept drug traffickers, right? And it's all about these connections that the government has with the, with the people on the ground because they're the ones making the big money. It's very similar to what's happening in Haiti where the richest people are the ones that control the ports and all of the um, ships coming in and out. And he just said like, that's why we, we don't get it fixed. We don't have a record, it's always broken. Um, but my job is to be here to oversee, you know, this uh, radar facility and it doesn't really ever work. And that's by design, he said. He wasn't saying it was an accident or we just missed the shipment. So so I think that's, Canada works in this kind of backhanded way too. Thank you, Kevin. Um, are there any uh, panelists who have any thoughts on Canada's power um, in CARICOM? Do we, do we have power? And if so, how did we amass? How did we amass it? Any, any, any thoughts on that? Anything you'd like to share? So, so I will say that even though CARICOM is a regional organization in the Caribbean, if we take something like security, for instance, I think almost half or maybe even over half of CARICOM's security budget is externally funded. And the top contributors to that funding of security are US, Canada, and Europe in that order. So I'm assuming when they say Europe, it's probably like Britain and France or whoever former colonizers were in some of the states that have independence. And so when you have a regional mandate that is externally funded or has a large part of your regional mandate being externally funded, I think that those external funds are able to buy you influence mm -hmm. because it is not just the case that they are giving you money so that you can run the organization how you want. But when, Care when Canada specifically gives money for security funding to CARICOM, it is for uh, policing borders and prisons. And so, you know, just by those three mandates, I'm not surprised that they're trying to collect or intercept anything that may be coming through coastal waters. And so when people ask about why there is influence, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they fund a lot of these initiatives in the Caribbean. A lot of security initiatives in the Caribbean just in general are externally funded. They are not internally funded by states. And without that external funding, a lot of the, I think like regional policing meetings and things that happen just wouldn't occur because outside of even looking at, you know, things from a military perspective, there are regional police unions that meet up in the Caribbean and oftentimes there's a lot of uh, the Royal Canadian Mountain Police or whatever it is in those meetings. And it's like, why are you guys there for a regional thing in the Caribbean if you're you know, so far away um, in some respect? And so I think they have power because they give a lot of the funding and they are dictating a lot of what is securitized in the region. Thank you, Tamanisha. I would only I would only add that I think to understand uh, Canada in the Caribbean and in part one has to kind of telescope outward and and look at Canada in the world and look at at Canada in terms of of a series of alliances that that it has with with other nations, especially the United States. And I think you know I, I don't know if we know what does it mean for Canada to be part of the Five Eyes Alliance with domestic espionage and then what does it mean for canada to be a part of, of nato and and how does that impact uh canadian foreign policy uh in in the Carib in the caribbean thank you peter so we have a couple more questions here um there is a question uh around british imperialism um one of our uh audience members wants to know whether canadian policies 
uh, in the Caribbean are a continuation and extension of British imperialism in disguise. We also have, I'm gonna group this together with another question we got earlier um, around uh, the question of the British colonies, which is how serious was the movement in Canada to actually take over the British colonies in the Caribbean? So those, uh, those two questions. Um, do any of our panelists have any, any thoughts? Um, British imperialism in disguise, how serious was Canada about taking over the British colonies in the Caribbean? I think Paula probably has a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> Paula, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, that's a really big question. Um, and I think that uh, certainly when there was, you know, pushback uh, in, um, in Canada among different populations, including Black populations in Canada and in the Caribbean to this question of union, the the idea of Britain was was central um, throughout this history. This idea of you know British justice and fair play that's being um, you know part of this this rhetoric that emerges much earlier. And I think that um, the idea was there was often often a comparison between Canada as an American nation versus Canada as this British nation and how that they would function as uh, you know taking over from London uh, and and would they administer the, the, the colonies in the Caribbean uh, in this tradition of British justice, or would they, they do so in, in the tradition of you know, um, American you know, racism and violence and things like that? Um, and so the, the, you know, the question of, um, you know, I guess in the post-independence you know, post period um, after decolonization, I think it's a different question. Like it's a, it's it's a it's a huge question that I don't know that I can you know adequately answer in terms of um, because there, there are so many different um, uh, manifestations of Canadian imperialism and its exploitative practices, right? Um, economically, culturally, socially, in terms of migration, um, that it's 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 not really something I thought about all that much in terms of. The parallels, right? There are perhaps similar patterns of exploitation um, that have have you know um, um, would have continued in the period perhaps before decolonization. But it's it's difficult for me to because it was so complicated. I think it's it's difficult for me to make any observations or conclusions about how how Canadian involvement in the Caribbean would have. Um, would have just been a, um, a continuation of British imperialism. Um, but I think in many ways it would have been, that's just my, my, my sense of certainly in the earlier period when there was a lot of um, veneration for Britain and British ideas and British institutions uh, and the sense of you know, British justice which of course is a contested term. Um, but after that, you know, after when, when Canada starts to remove itself from the British fold in the 50s and particularly the 60s. Uh, I'm not sure that the I'm not sure that it would be as easy to answer that question of 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 whether or not um, Canada would continue on in the British tradition. Thank you, Paula. Um, so we have a few um, historical questions um one 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 uh, you um person sent in a question in advance asking about the connections between the colonization of turtle island and the caribbean and um what this sort of says about canada's uh, colonial imagination colonial ideology we also have someone in the chat who wants um to know and it seems related whether there are any similarities between canada and australia um, and, and the treatment uh, of Aboriginal people there. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if there's anyone, do any of our panelists wanna to speak to either of those uh, questions? I will, I will say this since I have a, so I have a, um, I do have an article coming out and it's about militarism and in it I say that people need to critique uh, Anglospheric settler states like Canada, Australia, New Zealand just as much. Um, and I, I would say that there are certainly parallels in these states' activities abroad, but to say the exact extent, I don't know what they are. I remember a while back, I was looking at uh, Kiribati and how Australia uses drones to stop or intercept those people from being able to migrate to Australia. 
um, even though it is on these Pacific islands, uh, you know, exploiting them as well. So I assume that there would be parallels um, in that respect, but I, I don't think that there are enough people investigating a lot of these other states that are just as imperialistic simply because the United States exists. Um, and I think that that is a serious misstep or a, a serious oversight because when we talk about organizations like NATO or when we talk about security collaborations between uh, the US, Europe, Canada, and all of these other states, what we're really talking about is the fact that there's a European and a broader or more general Anglospheric alliance that exists and it continues to exploit states in the present. And if we don't have enough people uh, researching or talking about the exploitation that who they consider the small actors are engaged in, a lot of the different kinds of exploitations and how we can build solidarity between struggles um, get lost. And so I think it is important to do deeper investigations of those, but I cannot say that I do a deep investigation of Australia. Can I, um, I think the, the, the questions are, the, the comparative questions are extremely important. Um, and I'm not the person who could, could respond to the question, but I also think it's important to, to for this panel today to refocus a little bit on, on Canada and the, the Caribbean per se, because I think one of the things that I'm, I'm hearing from the panelists and that I'm learning a lot from the panelists is that the levels of research that still need to be done on this relationship uh, are, are, I mean, there, there's so much work to be done. And I know, you know, I, I, I've done some research into the history of Canadian banking um, in, in the Caribbean. And one of the difficulties that I had um, and I don't know if, if Paula also had this, this, this difficulty uh, writing Dominion over Pine and Palm, is that you can't get access <clears throat> to the archives of the Royal Bank of Canada, or the Bank of Nova Scotia, or the Bank of Montreal, or the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Now, these are institutions that the Canadian public sees as basically public institutions, even though they're, they're, they're private with, with these federal charters, but they don't allow you access to anything. The history of all of the things that we are asking, going back 200 years, are, is in those archives. The answers are there. The answers are in the, the documentation. I think a, 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 a scholar called Neil Quigley, uh, once upon a time, got access to the Bank of Nova Scotia uh, uh, board minutes, but no one has been in there since then. And this is a problem to me. And I think that there, there should be some way that we're advocating to get those archives open. Um, not, and, and, you know, because if we're looking at the history of banking, we're also looking at the history of sugar. We're looking at the history of shipping. We're looking at the history of, of, of lumber. We're looking at the history of, of migration. We're looking at the history of diplomacy. But we also have to remember, we're not just looking at the history of banking. We need to talk about Canadian insurance firms in the, in the Caribbean. As people have pointed out, uh, uh, in the chat, we have to talk about the history of Canadian mining companies in, in the Caribbean, in South America and Africa. And these are some of the largest mining companies in the world. And as people like Eve Engler and others are doing, we have to look at the history of the Canadian arms trade at this point and, and the work that they, they've been doing. And I think, you know, again, going back to the comment that Canada is the peaceful brother or whatever, but they're also, Canada's a major exporter of, of, of arms. And I think that it, it, it benefits Canada to promote military occupation in, 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 in Haiti because they get to send Canadian uh, uh, troop carriers and things to Haiti. And so there's, there's a political and financial and manufacturing loop that's, that occurs here. But it becomes impossible to do that research without access to archives or, or without a, a kind of team of, of, of students and professors who are really to kind of collectively work to, to try to unearth, unearth that material through trade publications um, and through published documents that might be available through the, the NATO archive or the OAS archive or the IMF archive or the Inter-American uh, Inter Development Bank archive or the Minister archives or the United Nations archives. Thank you, Peter. We have a couple of questions about uh, banks. I'm gonna just read all of them out. Um, Tamara wants to know, are there any lawsuits against banks for exploitation, restitution for slavery, et cetera? Um, Someone wanted to know about Canada's role in writing banking legislation after independence and Canada's relationship um, uh, to the Caribbean Development Bank um, and whether uh, and what their role was in establishing that. Um, 
is there anyone who'd like to speak to any of those questions maybe briefly as we're coming to the end of our time together? Well, I will say, and this is what my dissertation focused on, was about how Canada had a hand in writing a lot of the banking legislation and finance laws in Caribbean states after their independence, precisely because uh, they already had established dominance in a lot of these English-speaking Caribbean states prior to them receiving independence. Uh, and a lot of the legislation that they helped Caribbean states write was to somewhat not have any uh, harmful or negative sorts of legislation towards themselves, especially when it came to expat or repatriating profits abroad or heavily investing in foreign industries. And so Canadian banks have a big hand in sort of setting up a lot of the tourist industries and tourism sectors uh, in the Caribbean region today that we associate with exploitation or um, you know, facilitating negative service economies. And I think that, again, not a lot of people speak about this or talk about it precisely because, as Dr. Hudson pointed out, a lot of these uh, documents are unavailable. So I also had trouble when I'm doing my dissertation and even now when I'm trying to do research, accessing bank records or bank information prior to, I think, like prior to 1990 or something, they close it off at that point. But the bankers themselves, uh, you know, as they were seen as the dominant banking uh, entities in the Caribbean region, they helped states write a lot of that, those legislation, and they wrote it in a way that they could be very competitive over even the creation of local banks in the Caribbean. And so if we look at the, you know, Eastern Caribbean region, for instance, you have a lot of those countries which set up or develop their own sort of like uh, state banks or local banks. And their state and local banks had to pay higher interest and higher taxes than even these foreign banks that had all of this capital, precisely because Canadian bankers helped to legislate a lot of the banking laws um, in their countries. So, yeah. I, I think um, obviously the, uh, the the CARICOM reparations committee is 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 looking towards England in terms of trying to uh, get restitution for for slavery. I I don't know. Uh, I don't think they're looking uh, north uh, to 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 Montreal and Toronto uh, to do something to do something similar. I don't think that's on the agenda at all. I would also say that the the question of reparations, in my mind, shouldn't simply be reparations for slavery. We also have to remember that the Royal Bank of Canada was the banker to Machado in Cuba. It was the banker to Trujillo in the Dominican Republic, and it was the banker to both Duvaliers. We don't know how much money was squirreled out of the country, uh, uh, out of the Dominican Republic, out of Port-au-Prince, and out of Havana to Montreal uh, when those dictatorships ended. The, no one knows. Um, and so when we talk about reparations, we also might want to talk about reparations for uh, odious debts and the, the, the violence of dictatorship in the 20th century and linking that to Canadian banks. Thank you so much, Peter. On a related uh, note, Kurt uh, wants to know uh, about what are some of the mass-based formations across the Caribbean that represent the voice of grassroots opposition to Canada's policies in the region? Do those exist? The question has sort of been answered a little bit. Um, and what insights can we learn from them? Are, are there any, is there any more that uh, panelists can offer our audience around the resistance um, that, 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 that does or does not exist? Um, to uh, Canada's policies in the region. I, I would just very quickly say that that my, you know, I, I think other people on the panel could speak about contemporary formations, but we also have to remember that that the the movement of Black power across the Caribbean was in part a movement against Canadian imperial finance in in the region, and so we can look to that that kind of history as well as to uh, uh, to more contemporary formations to to um, to develop a critique. Thank you, Peter. Um... All right, so there's a couple of questions around Haiti and um, and sort of police. I'm gonna I'm gonna put those together. Francisco wants to know about um, gangs in Haiti uh, as a term that's used generally and broadly. 
um, and wants to know about their role in uh, resistance and the criminalization of, uh, of gangs in Haiti. Um, and uh, Susan wants to know um, why uh, our Canadian, oh, sorry, there's someone who, who asked a question in advance, how does Canada have the power to even send police to Haiti? It's another question. So two questions about Haiti. And then uh, Susan wants to know why Canadian special forces are deployed to Jamaica. So any, any sorry, quick thoughts on, on any of those questions? Gangs, police in Haiti, and special forces in Jamaica. So these are sort of current questions. What, what I would say um, in terms of the gang question, that's a big one um, in terms of, of Haiti or any other country. But something to look into is how gangs emerge out of political vacuums. In the case of Haiti, it was deliberately done, right? That you had the state, which also had armed paramilitary groups, the lepers, the, the Makuts, the, you had all of these groups that were there. Um, but once the state and Canada and the United States have played a huge role in disintegrating the government of Haiti. Um, it's all well and good as long as it's a dictatorship and it's you know, helping to undermine, as everyone on the panel has mentioned, other progressive movements around the region. Connecting back to that other question um, is that a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll keep focused on the gang part and not go into all the bits about you know, the Eastern Caribbean states undermining Grenada and officially signing off to not make it seem like a imperial intervention, right? Like this is the way that things get used, but gangs emerge when people need to find a way to defend themselves, right? Like, and, and it can be very heroic in some cases, it's like Robin Hood, or it can be very parasitic and predatory. And I think that a lot of that gets lost that I'm concerned with a lot of the narratives that are coming out in Haiti, that some of these leaders like barbecue and there, there's somehow these revolutionaries that are out to take on, um, you know, the interests of poor people. Um, first, the dude was a cop, which uh, I think like we need to be suspect for. Where it's like where this political consciousness is coming from, that all of a sudden you see the the the, the power vacuum exists and how you can insert yourself into it and that you can look to Haiti's history and that people do have this um like on not I don't know the exact word I'm not an eloquent person but the fire has not been put out so if you can take that and kind of bottle it and say that you're going to embody it and fight against you know fight the good fight for justice and equality and anti-imperialism You'll get some people to ride with you, but you need to look at the backstory of where this person came from and the fights that he was fighting before and who he was killing. Um, it's very different because these documentaries that come out make it seem like, yeah, he's making sure that poor people can eat and exist and do all of this when he was massacring people on behalf of an unelected, unpopular, illegitimate government before. So the government in Haiti relies on gangs because it has been eroded, but also at the same time, it's funneling its resources out of the country, right? So as what Peter mentioned, you know, we don't know where Duvalier put all of the money, right? And all of these senators and all of these politicians that are getting sanctioned up in Canada, it's very convenient now that they're starting to do that, but we're not looking at the guns coming in from Miami and Dade right, that they're saying the Canadian boats are going to patrol Port-au-Prince, they're not jumping onto any boats coming from the U.S. where they have these, like, grenade launchers on them that are going to take people, like, it, it doesn't make any sense to me, right, and and just even going to the history as to why these ports were privatized, right, and why Haiti can't govern its own ports, why that was put in the hands of a small group of elite people, and we're all wondering why, how could this happen, right, I think, like, that's a, and, and, you know, I know people have been writing on it, but that's, that's something that we really need to speak to is it's not, so how did this happen? It's just like, who are these people and why can't we hold them accountable? Like their names are there. They're in power in our country and they're in power in Haiti and in Miami, right? It's not so difficult. It's just that that's how the system works, right? You know, it's kind of depressing in that sense, but they all have addresses, they have names. Martelli is not 
one of these people that's sanctioned, which is kind of crazy, right? Um, people that own the ports, they're not sanctioned, right? So, so can Canada and Canada's involved in this, right? When they wanted to get rid of Aristide, they were pressuring, right, to be like, you need to privatize the ports, and that was one of the things that he ended up conceding. Um, why was why was that the case, right? Thank you, Kevin. So we have come uh, to the end of our time. I'm wondering if we have, are there any uh, final thoughts from any of the panelists uh, before we close out today? Um, anything uh, you'd like to say before we end for the evening? All right, so on that note, I just wanna thank our panelists for a brilliant, lively, important discussion. Thank you for your tremendous analysis and scholarship. I feel like I want to hear more from you um, and that we need more like this. We need more research. Um, it's not easy. Um, and you're contributing so much. Um, I know that I personally have learned so much tonight. Um, I do implore people at home to share uh, the recording of this event. Um, get it out there. Um, and to all of you at home, I thank you for your interest in exploring Canada's uh, relationship to the Caribbean. Um, we have an action that I placed in the chat that you can take, uh, uh, write a letter to Trudeau saying no to Can Canadian military intervention in Haiti, find out more about all of our brilliant speakers um, and their books and their work, their activism and their scholarship. Um, the film Haiti Betrayed can also be watched uh, for free on our site, foreignpolicy.ca, Elaine Breer's excellent film about Canada's role in Haiti. Um, if you like discussions like these, please do consider uh, donating and help us keep going uh, at foreignpolicy.ca slash donation. Um, so good night, everyone. It's been a great, great evening. Thanks to our speakers, Tamanisha, Kevin, Paula, um, Peter. Uh, and as always, for our audience at home, stay informed, stay engaged. Happy Black History Month and peace, everybody. Good night.